Hello everyone, welcome to the 20th lecture of this massive open online course on sociology of development. As you know, we are going to end with the 8th week of this course on sociology of development, dependency theory. Uh, I mean background to the Latin American uh, debates on underdevelopment and so on. This is the last lecture of this week and in the next week, uh, we are going to discuss uh, the Latin American uh, dependency school having moved away from the background to uh, the main topics. Okay? Background helps us shape and reshape our uh, thought processes about any particular event or a phenomenon. Okay? As you know, we have discussed till now dependency theory, how it refers to a set of theories which maintained that the failure of the third world states to achieve adequate and sustainable levels of development which resulted from their dependence on the advanced capitalist world and dependency theories developed in opposition to the optimistic claims of modernization theory which saw the less developed countries being able to catch up with the West. They, I mean, the proponents of dependency theory stressed that Western societies had an interest in maintaining their advantaged position in relation to the less developed countries and had the financial and technical wherewithal to do so. A variety of different accounts of the relationship between the advanced and less developed states evolved within the broader framework of dependency theory ranging from the stagnationism and surplus trend theory of Andre Grunder Frank which predicted erroneously that the third world would be unable to achieve significant levels of industrialization to the more cautious pessimism of those who envisaged a measure of growth based on associated dependent relations with the West. The major contribution to dependency theory was undoubtedly that of Frank who devised and popularized the phrase the development of underdevelopment describing what he saw as the deformed and dependent economies of the peripheral states in his terminology the satellites of the more advanced metropolises. In Capitalism and Underdevelopment in Latin America of 1969, Frank argued that the third world was doomed to stagnation because the surplus that it generated was appropriated by the advanced capitalist countries through agencies such as transnational corporations, multinational corporations. Frank himself insisted that growth could only be achieved by serving ties with capitalism and pursuing autocentric socialist development strategies. The dependency theory was flawed by an overemphasis on economic factors and in some versions a necessitarian logic based on the idea of a surplus drain from the less developed countries to the rich and powerful nations. When I say surplus drain, I mean extraction and appropriation of profits by the advanced capitalist nations. Nonetheless, it had the merit of drawing attention to the international dimension of development and brought the power relations between states under scrutiny. The emergence of the newly industrializing countries as a group of successful led developers challenged the validity of the core assumptions of the dependency theory, demonstrating that successful late industrialization was possible under certain circumstances and suggesting the need for a more sophisticated and disaggregated approach to the third world development. And that is how we have discussed how the dependency approach originated in the extensive Latin American debate on the problems of underdevelopment, how not only dependency approach con did contain an effective criticism of the modernization, it also provided an alternative perspective and still functions as a catalyst in the development theory which is taking shape at present. The dependency school as you know emerged from the, from the convergence of two intellectual trends, on the one hand New Marxism and on the other the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America, popularly known as the Eclat Tradition. 
And we have discussed how the concept of new Marxism reflects a certain dualism in Marxist thinking that is on the one hand the traditional approach focusing on the concept of development and taking a basically Eurocentric view and on the other hand a more recent approach focusing on the concept of underdevelopment and expressing a third world view. However, controversies persist as to the continuity or discontinuity of these two approaches. A second important background to the dependency school was the more indigenous Latin American discussion on underdevelopment reflecting specific economic and intellectual experiences in various Latin American countries, particularly the Great Depression of the 1930s. And such economic crisis dramatized the version of Latin American dependence and it initiated more systematic economic research and necessitated a policy of import substitution later systematized into a development strategy. We have also discussed Marxism versus Neo Marxism, uh, Marx, Marx and the Third World, Marxism in Latin America, the New Left in Latin America, and Paul Barron's concept of economic surplus and the way he tried to make distinction between actual surplus on the one hand and potential surplus on the other, and that led to the rise of neo Marxism. And we have discussed differences between Marxism and neo Marxism from four vantage points namely, imperialism and nationalism, classes, revolution and ethics, and ecology. As we have discussed, Marxism as interpreted by Lenin sees imperialism in a centers perspective that is, a, that is as a stage of development of capitalism that is, monopoly capitalism, and neo Marxism sees imperialism from the peripheries or the victims' point of view. That is how the interest has shifted from development to underdevelopment from the from the more advanced uh, capitalist countries to the less developed countries. So, far as classes are concerned, uh, the Marxist analysis of classes is based on specifically European experiences, while that of the neo Marxists is based on the revolutionary struggle in the third world with a much more generous view of different groups uh, revolutionary potential. In other words, whereas Marxists have difficulties seeing anyone but the industrial proletariat as the revolutionary class power preference, the neo Marxists tend to let the peasantry play this role, claiming that the industrial workers of the third world in reality form a labor aristocracy. And Marxists believe in the existence or eventual emergence of a national bourgeois in the third world, whereas neo Marxists see the bourgeois as the creation and tool of imperialism and as such incapable of fulfilling its role as the liberator of the forces of production. And coming to revolution and ethics, we have discussed how the neo Marxists view the possibilities of starting a revolution with greater optimism even if the conditions may be unfavorable, whereas Marxism emphasizes organization and peasant party work particularly amongst the industrial workers, whereas neo Marxists emphasize the role of subjective factors, moral st stimuli, the new individual, new man and so on, Marxists retain materialism and the emphasis on objective conditions. Coming to ecology, Marxism still shows uh, traces of the 19th century development optimism in this, for example, industrialization, 19th century evolutionism and so on, whereas some new Marxists now tend to integrate the growing ecological consciousness and the demands of environmental movements with their theory of development, I mean sustainable development, they challenge uh, the blind faith in industrialism and so on. Because why sustainable development? Precisely because we have to conserve our natural resources for our future generations because our natural resources are scarce or limited. But scarcity for Marxists is nothing but a bourgeois invention for legitimizing uh, economic inequality. Then we have discussed ECLA development thinking through three uh, parameters, Raoul Previs and the ECLA tradition, programmed industrialization, the ECLA theory of development. And when I say Raoul Previs and ECLA tradition, I mean how Previs uh, emphasized on inward directed development and industrialization as remedies for underdeveloped countries import substitution strategy was recommended by ECLA in the 1950s and so on and uh, Prebyshev's attack on the neoclassical theory of trade. 
and uh, when I say process of industrialization, I refer to import substitution, production of raw materials, greater dependence on foreign subsidiaries, government in involvement to break the chains of underdevelopment and ECLA, I mean the driving force behind the efforts at creating a Latin American common market in order to facilitate further industrialization. And program industrialization, what I mean the first phase refers to the strategies, the second phase translates these strategies into practical policies and industrialization policy should be there to reverse the process of underdevelopment that is called programmed industrialization. Land reforms and other basic structural changes were neglected. Local planners in the ECLA way of thinking were incorporated and a modern society was sort of. Decline of traditional oligarchy leads to both economic and political democracy modern mass consumption with a high level of technology, culture and scientific activity. And we have discussed uh, how previous analysis of terms of trade, external sector, structural imbalances between center and periphery, underdevelopment, I mean the result of a specific process that has led to underdevelopment in one part of the world and development in another. That is how underdevelopment is not undevelopment. Undevelopment means lack of development. But underdevelopment, I mean it is the result of a specific process, historical process that has led to underdevelopment in one part of the world, for example, in India and development in another, for example, Western Europe. And uh, Prebis tried to look at, uh, deploy a uh, structuralist method, peripheries uh, deteriorating terms of trade affect the accumulation of capital and consequently also the rate of economic growth. Structural problems with automatically created inflationary measures increased government involvement. And, and in this lecture, what we are going to do, we are going to look at the Latin American critique of the modernization paradigm through Stavenagen's um, seven erroneous theses on Latin America, Cardoso's, uh, uh, I mean Stavenagen Cardoso in the context of Mexico. Uh, Dos Santos in the context of uh, Brazil, uh, Sankel in the context of Chile, Frank of course he was a German economist of development but he, he was trying to look at the entire Latin American continent and Frank of course, Andre Gunder Frank of course he was the main, he, was, he is considered the principal architect of, of the dependencies theory. Okay? Starting with, uh, I mean, we are just trying to give a background in the in the lectures to follow from the ninth week onward, we'll enter the debate between among these uh, authors, among these thinkers, uh, at length and in detail. Okay, when we look at the Latin American critique of the modernization paradigm, okay, as a prefatory remark, let me tell you that the economic growth of more industrialized countries of Latin America implementing the ECLA policies came to a halt during the 1960s. Instead of taking off into a self-sustained growth, there was general economic stagnation and as a result of that, both social and political problems came to the fore. The shortcomings of the policy, policy of import substitution uh, were becoming obvious. The purchasing power was limited to certain social strata, to certain social classes and the domestic market showed no tendency to expand after its needs had been fulfilled. The import dependency had uh, simply shifted from consumption goods to capital goods. The conventional export goods were neglected in the general frenzy of industrialization. The result was acute balance of payments uh, problems in one country after another. The optimism of growth changed into deep depression. Raul Prebisch uh, and, and Fortado, two veterans of Latin American development economics, both realized that Although industrialization was initiated, it did not automatically continue by itself. What Fortado in 1966, he said, in Latin America, there is a general consciousness of living through a period of decline. The phase of easy development 
through increasing exports of primary products or through import substitution has everywhere been exhausted. The growing, I mean the growing consciousness of the fact that economic growth for as long as it lasted did not necessarily have any social or political counterparts also contributed to the widespread pessimism. During the 1960s, the ECLA published a report on the social situation in Latin America together with the annual economic review. Together, these publications offered a peculiar picture of the development on the one hand industrialization and growth and on the other hand unemployment and marginalization. Much tom tomed uh, claims by several governments uh, that, that we are in the process of development and growth, industrialization, uh, uh, self reliance, Atmanirbhar. Okay. But, but at the end of the day, we also witness in several countries unemployment and further marginalization. Many students of development see this as confirmation of the fact that established development thinking is going through such a crisis and therein lies the significance of these, these five authors that we are going to cover in this lecture. Stavenhagen comes first in the context of Mexico, Stavenhagen's seven I mean, uh, if you if you slightly recall, we have already dealt with the ECLA critique of simplified growth theories and the view of foreign trade as the prime mover behind development. In this context, let us discuss with a much broader uh, perspective which questioned the entire established paradigm of modernization. In an influential essay from 1966, the Mexican sociologist uh, Rudolfo Stavenhagen uh, criticized what he called the seven erroneous theses on Latin America. What are those, what are those seven erroneous theses that Stavenhagen wanted to foreground? The first is the Latin American countries are dual societies. What do we mean by this? When I say, I mean when Stavenhagen challenged this, this argument that now, this proposition that Latin American societies are dual societies, this proposition states that two different and to a certain extent independent societies exist within the Latin American countries. One traditional agrarian society and the other modern urbanized society. The traditional agrarian society is often associated with feudalism and the modern urbanized society is often associated with capitalism, which also implies that feudalism is an obstacle to development that must be replaced by progressive capitalism. Both societies are however in reality the result of the same process. As feudalism uh, displaced slavery, capitalism displaced feudalism. Okay? The second erroneous thesis that uh, Stephen again tried to foreground that progress in Latin America will come about by the spread of industrial products into the backward archaic and traditional areas. Such thesis, such argument assumes that the modern expensive sector automatically starts a process of development in the traditional sector, that the transition from traditional to modern society is a process which inevitably includes all the traditional societies in the world today. And, the, and that the centers of modernity are nothing but the result of the propagation of elements originating in already developed countries. Stavenhagen objected to this by claiming that the, the spreading out of modern consumption goods did not imply an increasing uh, or rise in welfare per se and, and that it instead managed to drive out local industries and trades and eventually led to classes of middlemen and money lenders. As far as capital is concerned, the spreading seemed to go in the opposite direction from the backward areas to the developed areas and the progress of the modern area was in reality achieved at the traditional areas expense. Thirdly, the existence of the backward traditional and archaic rural areas uh, is an obstacle to the formation of an internal market and to the development of a progressive and rational capitalism. 
in other words in stavenagen's opinion this was false because in in latin america there was no progressive national capitalism nor were the conditions such that one might develop fourthly the national bourgeois has an interest in breaking the power and the dominion of the landed oligarchy the land owners financiers and industrialists interests were in reality joined uh, in the same economic groups the same companies and occasionally even in the same families there is no reason why the national bourgeois and and the land oligarchy shouldn't get along fifthly latin american development is the work and creation of a nationalism of a nationalist progressive enterprising and dynamic middle class and the social and economic policy objectives of the latin american government should be to stimulate social mobility and the development of that class which class you know that nationalist progressive enterprising and dynamic middle class in other words those classes called the middle class are very closely connected with the existing economic and political structures and lack the dynamic that might make them catalysts in in a process of independent economic development sixthly national integration in latin america is the product of uh, miscegenation miscegenation uh, implies interracial um, marriages interracial sex and so on this this is this argument suggests that um, the development was moving towards uh, some kind of universal society in which the differences between the dominant white uh minority and the mass natives in the rural areas would disappear this thesis was wrong because uh, biological and cultural mixing doesn't imply a change in the existing structure per se in the internal latin american colonies this mestizos represent the local and regional ruling classes and do in fact suppress the natives that's how we will find the natives get displaced from their real habitat and finally progress in latin america will only take place by means of the identity of an alliance between the industrial workers and the peasantry as a result of the identity of interests of these two classes such argument has primarily been examined by the orthodox left but the workers and peasants interests were in reality not identical in latin america it is a fact that the stronger the, the internal colonialism that is the greater the differences between the metropolis and its domestic colonies the less opportunities there are for a true political alliance between workers and peasants and in this sense stephen again tried to foreground seven erroneous theses on latin america which um, were there uh, uh, by mm, or which have been propagated by the modernization uh, theorists uh, and so on coming to cardoso stavenhagen in fact was here thinking of the experiences in mexico which in fact were common to a number of latin american countries for example brazil perhaps brazil was the country in which development optimism of the 1950s had found its most uninhibited expression everyone right across the political spectrum thought that brazil was in the take off stage if you slightly recall uh, rosto's non communist manifesto uh, that uh, he he tried to look at five stages of growth one um, the traditional society uh, two pre take off three take off four drive to maturity and five high mass consumption okay if you look at this uh, everyone right across the political spectrum uh, thought that brazil was in the take off stage i mean the third stage and that those most responsible for this condition were the growing number of uh, entrepreneurs okay during this time sociologists in sao paulo established the center for industrial sociology where the various industries in the sao paulo area were studied in a sumpeterian perspective sumpeter's theory of innovation and so on the results were not uh, always as expected the brazilian businessmen did not turn out to be the backbone of the growing latin american bourgeois they were found to be totally devoid of initiative and energy totally dependent on the government and foreign capital doubt therefore arose 
what what Cardozo tried to look at um, that doubt therefore arose about the Latin American Burjo. Uh, the thought that it was incapable of fulfilling its historical mission to release the productive powers and create a transition from feudalism to capitalism turned out to be a most important aspect of the dependency theory. Uh, Cardoso was among the sociologists who carried out the sociological studies of the entrepreneurs in Sao Paulo and later wrote a general critique of, of the current social sciences, uh, particularly the theory of modernization within sociology. Cardoso and Faletto pointed out that the pattern from traditional to modern, such kind of transition from tradition, uh, traditional to modern was a reincarnation of Ferdinand de Tony's, um, I mean, was a German sociologist, uh, 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 I mean, Tony's old dichotomy of Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Gemeinschaft means community, and Gesellschaft means association. You you will find in general community the term community in rural agrarian society and association in modern industrial society. Okay? When I say transition from tradition to modernity, transition from rural to urban, tra tra transition from community to association, they constitute certain dichotomous views. Okay? That is what Tony is suggested. But in this kind of a pattern from a pattern of transition from tradition to modern or from Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft. Uh, on this count, Cardoso and Faletto, uh, they raised two objections uh, to this. First, neither the concept of, of uh, modernization or, or rather the, the neither the concept is broad enough to uh, cover all existing social situations, nor is it specific uh, to distinguish the structures that determine the lifestyles of various societies. Okay? Modernization did not look at that. Modern, that is why modernization was ethnocentric in nature. Right? And secondly, these concepts do not show how various stages of economic development are linked to the various types of social structure characterized as either traditional or modern. With this kind of characterization, okay, um, it continues to be impossible to explain the transition from one type of society to another. In fact, change in social structures far from being only a cumulative process of incorporating new variables involves a series of relations among social groups, forces and classes through which some of them try to impose their domination over society. What uh, Cardoso and Faletto uh, called uh, that is the historical so structural method. That this, this historical structural method, in other words, I mean Cardoso's and Faletto's historical structural method is the alternative to the prevailing schematic and mechanical analysis. What for, for Cardoso and uh, Faletto, it is necessary to recognize from the very beginning that social structures are the product of individuals collective behavior. Therefore, although enduring social sciences, social structures can be and in fact are continuously transformed by social movements. Consequently, their approach is both structural as well as historical. It emphasizes why structural, how structural? No, it emphasizes not just the structural conditioning of social life. Okay? When I say structural method, I mean st structural conditioning of social life. But also the historical transformations, historical transformations, historical uh, 
transformation uh, of structures but how historical transformation of structures how no by conflict by social movements by class struggles and and thus their methodology was historical structural that's why when they when they say cardoso and fileto they suggested that their uh, methodology is is historical and historical structural they emphasized on structural conditioning of social life and at the same time transformation of structures by conflict social movements and class struggles and and such criticism of the prevailing development theory and the search for alternative approaches was obviously an expression of a more widespread intellectual climate in latin america in the mid 1960s coming to the context of brazil dos santos uh, traditional ideas about development and then basic requisites for a more solid theory of development that's what i mean first dos santos try, tried to uh, challenge uh, certain traditional ideas about development and then he tried to uh, propose basic requisites for a more solid theory of development what he meant here uh, uh, dos santos uh, um, uh, he tried to sum up the traditional ideas about development like this okay development means advancement towards certain well defined general objectives which correspond to the specific condition of individual and society to be found uh, in the most advanced societies of the modern world and this model uh, is variously known as modern society industrial society mass society and so on secondly these are traditional ideas about development secondly underdeveloped countries would make progress or would progress towards this model this model of modern society this model of industrial society this model of mass society and so on as soon as they have eliminated certain social political cultural and institutional obstacles these obstacles are represented by traditional societies feudal systems or feudal residues uh, depending upon the particular school of thought thirdly certain economic political and psychological processes can be singled out as allowing the most rational mobilization of national resources and these can be categorized for the use of economic planners and fourthly to all this is added uh, the need to coordinate uh, certain social and political forces uh, in support of a development policy and to devise an uh, ideological basis which organizes the will of various nations in the tasks of development these are the traditional ideas about development but once the conventional development theories have been proven to be indefensible dos santos goes on to provide the basic requisites basic prerequisites uh, for a more solid theory of development okay and it is this this these prerequisites are threefold uh, 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 i mean the, the a threefold prerequisite was uh, proposed by dos santos a brazilian uh, development theorist first the theory of development must analyze the process of development in its various historical and concrete manifestations secondly the theory of development must extract through such historical analysis the general laws of development of the societies that it chooses to investigate and in formulating these laws thirdly the the development theory the theory of development must take into account the international contradictions of the process abandoning any formalistic attempt to reduce it to an unilineal transition from one type of society to another rather the theory would have to show how through these very contradictions okay i mean international contradictions society as a whole can reach higher forms of organization uh, and these forces 
and the social forms that they imply are better described as social trends as models of a future situation. Moving now from Brazil to Chile, for example, keeping in mind um, that both Cardoso and Dos Santos uh, went to Chile after the Bra Brazilian military uh, coup in 1964. Let us see um, the same um, phenomenon, great dissatisfaction or the way in which uh, the established social sciences explain the Latin American reality and at their inability to provide guidelines for an adequate policy of development. And therein lies the significance of Sankel. What Blomstrom and, and Hetney, why they chose uh, Chilean economist Oswaldo Sankel, uh, formerly with, who was formerly with the Ecla tradition, as an example of this dissatisfaction. Sankel claimed that the problem with the prevailing um, analysis of the development question was that it was based on the conventional uh, theories of growth and modernization. As claimed by other Latin American development theorists to whom uh, we have already discussed, I mean uh, maybe Stavenag and uh, uh, Cardoso, Dos Santos and, uh, and so on, um, you will find that the, this, this theory saw the mature capitalist economy as the goal of all development efforts. Okay? Uh, the, the under mature capitalist economy as I mean the, the, the um, when I say mature capitalist economy and those who are not matured I mean underdeveloped nations were analyzed in terms of a previous and imperfect stage on the way to this goal. Sankel believed that this idealized and mechanical uh, vision ought to be replaced uh, by a more historical method, the result of which would be a better understanding of the real nature of the underdeveloped nation structure and its changes. The approach suggested by uh, Sankel simply meant that the characteristics of underdevelopment should be uh, viewed as normal results of the functioning of a specific system. In the case of the underdeveloped nations, these results uh, are well known, low income or low, uh, a slow rate of growth, uh, regional imbalance, inequality, unemployment, dependency, monoculture and cultural, economic, social and political marginalization and so on. The conventional theory considered these symptoms to be deviations from the ideal pattern which like children's diseases would disappear with growth and modernization. It did not realize that behind this layer system, the formal functioning of, um, of which produced these results and this, that this would continue as long as development policies attacked the symptoms of underdevelopment rather than the basic structural elements that had created underdevelopment. According to Sankel, once Latin America is seen in this perspective, it becomes obvious that considerable inf influence was exercised by external ties. However, their importance should not cover up the existence of internal structural problems. A realistic analysis of Latin American development should therefore be based on the assumption that the socio-economic system has been shaped by two types of um, Mm, structural elements namely external and internal. The external has been um, or the external factors or external problems uh, that, that Sankal referred to have been more important factors as far as Latin American uh, development is concerned. An adequate analytical scheme for the study of underdevelopment and for the formulation of development strategies must be based upon knowledge of the process, the structure and the system. When and I say this, underdevelopment cannot be seen as a stage in the development of an economically, politically and culturally autonomous society. Underdevelopment should rather be thought of 
as part of the global historical process of development. When I say global historical process of development, I mean underdevelopment and development are two sides of the same universal process that is they interact and are mutually conditional. Their geographic expression is manifested in two polarizations. First, the polarization of the world between the rich, industrialized and developed nations on the one hand and the underdeveloped, backward, poor, peripheral and dependent nations on the other. And secondly, the internal polarization between uh, advanced modern industries and, and the so-called traditional sector. The concepts of development and underdevelopment must therefore be seen as partial yet mutually dependent uh, structures forming one single system. Okay? Uh, one important characteristic which separates the two structures is that the developed system mainly because of its ability to grow to a great extent dominates while the underdeveloped system is dependent partly because of the nature of its own dynamics. All of this can of course be used both between nations as well as between regions within a country. This school of thought focused on two types of polarizing processes, one at the level of international relations and the other at the national level. We are good. I am just trying to provide a background to this. Okay? Now, now coming to uh, Andhra Gundar Frank, as far as uh, the group of scholars who were soon soon to be known as uh, the Dependish Tests. Okay? Uh, dependish, uh, dependent tests. Okay? I mean, they are known as the proponents of dependency theory. As far as the group of scholars who were soon soon to be known as the dependish test and their critique of the prevailing theory of development is concerned, it is difficult to ignore Andre Gundar Frank. Okay? Perhaps he is the main architect of, of the dependency theory. That is why it is very difficult to ignore Frank's influential works uh, namely capitalism and underdevelopment in Latin America and an influential paper that he wrote uh, uh, I mean the title is the sociology of development and underdevelopment of sociology okay uh, in 1969. In this paper sociology of development and underdevelopment of sociology Frank criticized the research center on economic development and cultural change and its periodical economic development and cultural change to which Frank himself had been a contributor. Frank's Latin American experiences uh, have obviously led him to question the paradigm of which this periodical is the foremost representative. It should be noted that in it Frank acknowledges his debt to Stavenhagen amongst others and there are certain similarities between Frank's and Stavenhagen's critique. Frank's critique is however more theoretical while Stavenhagen's uh, discussion uh, more concretely is tied to Latin American particularly Mexican empirical studies. Frank's critique was also um, more directly aimed at specific scholars particularly the group around the economic development and cultural change. Through his critique, Frank wanted to demonstrate that the modernization perspective as developed by uh, 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 Levy, Squarge, Eisenstadt uh, uh, and others, Tonys, Durkheim and others, Weber, okay. uh, such modernization perspective is empirically untenable theoretically inadequate, theoretically insufficient and practically incapable of stimulating a process of development in the third world. In view of the importance of his critique during the late 1960s, it might be justified to quote Frank's uh, arg uh, arguments about these three points. 
that modernization perspective is empirically untenable, theoretically insufficient and thirdly practically incapable of stimulating a process of development in the third world. Nevertheless, okay, it is important to limit this, this uh, to today's lecture uh, to, to an account of one of the variants of the paradigm of modernization namely uh, the one uh, uh, he calls the ideal typical index method. The idea of this method is to compare an underdeveloped country with a developed one by means of various indicators. The differences thus revealed are then established as the sustenance sub substance of development. The, this approach is manifested in two ways by this, the, I mean this approach, I mean this ideal typical index method is manifested in two ways uh, in terms of by pattern variables and by stages of growth. Pattern variables, I mean Parsonian, Talcott Parsons pattern variables and stages of growth, I mean Rostoj. Uh, well treatment Rostos growth okay uh, stages of growth the tradition of pattern variables goes back as far as classical sociology and was applied to the problems of uh, underdevelopment by Hosley's and uh, we have also discussed the stages of growth by Ro Rosto that is why uh, we did not uh, uh, repeat this uh, this stage of growth. Frank argues that many developed nations now st strong particularistic uh, I mean uh, many developed nations now demonstrate uh, strong particularistic tendencies that ascribed status is widespread and that the structure of roles is not as functionally specific as our official ideology uh, might have it. Similarly, traits of universalism, achievement and specificity might be found in the underdeveloped nations have after having destroyed the empirical basis of uh, the pattern variable analysis on the problems of underdevelopment frank goes on to question the theoretical basis for analysis hosley's i mean uh, from hosley's to weber to parsons i mean these pattern variables hosley's leaves far from clear just which is the social whole uh, whose role patterns he would change from one set of variables to another in order to affect development. Here, the theoretical inadequacy is even more glaring for it contravenes the generally accepted rule of social and scientific theory to look for and refer to the systemic whole in terms of which the reality in this case under development can be explained and changed. The social system which is today the determinant of underdevelopment certainly is not the family, tribe, community, a part of a dual society or even uh, as, as um, uh, Frank would have argued uh, any underdeveloped country or countries taken by themselves. As an example of such limitations of pattern variables analysis, Frank in terms of development policy mentions the fact that the growth of the middle class groups in Latin America has not led to a higher level of development, rather quite the contrary. Growth stages are a further development uh, of the pattern variable analysis in the sense that the two idealized poles are united through a series of stages. Rosto mentions as we have already discussed how he mentioned uh, five stages, uh, five such stages, the traditional society, the pre-takeoff stage, the takeoff stage, the road to maturity or drive to maturity and the high mass consumption, mass consumption society. It is difficult to find these stages in reality. Rostow's stages, uh, stages and, and arguments or thesis are incorrect primarily because they do not correspond to all the past or present reality of the underdeveloped countries whose development they are supposed to guide. It is explicit in Rostow as it is implicit in Hosley's that underdevelopment is the original stage of what are supposedly traditional societies that, that there were no stages prior to the present stage of underdevelopment. It is further explicit in Rostow that the now developed societies were once underdeveloped but all this is quite contrary to the fact. 
according to Frank, underdevelopment was not an original stage, rather a created condition. To exemplify, Frank points to the British deindustrialization of India, the destructive effects of the slave trade on African societies and the obliteration of the Indian civilization in Central and South America. The greatest problem in Rostow's analysis was nevertheless the fact that not all of the countries which according to him were ready for takeoff could manage the final jump. The theoretical shortcoming of Rostow's analysis is primarily the fact that it is based on comparative statics rather than being dynamic and that uh, the overall perspective is lost. In terms of development policy, the approach is gravely com compromised because of Rostow's political affiliation. As to the efficacy of the policy recommended by Rostow, it speaks for itself. No country once underdeveloped ever managed to develop by Rostow's stages. Is that why Rostow is now trying to uh, help the people of Vietnam, the Congo or uh, and the Dominican Republic and other underdeveloped countries to overcome the empirical, theoretical and policy shortcomings of his manifestly non-communist intellectual uh, aid to economic development and cultural change by bombs, chemical and biological weapons and military occupation. That is what uh, Frank uh, questioned, that is how Frank questioned Rostov. The tone of uh, what Blomstrom and uh, Hetney is, uh, uh, argue that the tone of Frank's article is strongly polemic, which is um, that is how he uh, that is how Frank tried to uh, write um, that that um, uh, that as to the efficacy of the policy recommended by Rostow, it speaks for itself. No country once underdeveloped uh, ever managed to develop by Rostow's stages. Is that why Rostow is now trying to uh, help the people of Vietnam, the Congo, the Dominican Republic uh, and any uh, or other de underdeveloped countries to overcome the empirical, theoretical and policy shortcomings of his manifestly non-communist intellectual aid to economic development and cultural change by bombs, chemical and biological weapons and military occupation. Okay. Uh, it is also typical of the intellectual climate at the universities of the metropoles during the late 1960s, during the so-called students, I mean during um, uh, the great upsurge by students uh, in France in 1968. Frank was one of the main suppliers of arguments with which the students criticized their teachers for having used bourgeois propaganda in their teaching. In other words, Frank played the role of popularizer and intermediary in the critical uh, uh, Latin American debate on the social sciences in the mid 1960s. Okay. Then what we have uh, discussed in this lecture, we have discussed uh, the Latin American critique of the modernization paradigm through the works of Stavenhagen, Cardoso, Dos Santos, Sankel and Frank. Uh, we have discussed Stavenhagen 7 erroneous thesis on Latin America, I mean how Latin American, I mean how uh, Stavenhagen tried to foreground a critique of this 7 thesis, how la the Latin America, uh, American countries are dual societies, how uh, progress in Latin America will come about by the spread of industrial production to the backward archaic and traditional areas and so on and these have been challenged by Stavenhagen and then we have discussed Cardoso. Uh, sociological studies of the entrepreneurs in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, 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 general critique of the current social sciences, particularly the theory of modernization within sociology. Um, I mean, Cardoso and Faletto, how they have uh, uh, foregrounded uh, uh, the fact that the, the I mean, foregrounded uh, and and challenged uh, the pattern from uh, traditional to modern. Uh, society uh, re reincarnation of Tony's old dichotomy of Gemenschaft and Gesellschaft, how they used uh, historical so structural method, I mean structural conditioning of social life on the one hand and transformation of structures through class struggles and so on on the other. Then we have discussed Dos Santos views about traditional ideas about development and then how 
Dos Santos in the context of Brazil uh, uh, provided basic prerequisites for a more solid theory of development. And then we have discussed Sankel's, Sankel's development strategies in the context of Chile, how concepts of development and underdevelopment, they are mutually uh, uh, dependent structures forming one single system, international uh, relations, national level and so on. And then we have discussed uh, Frank's uh, uh, reflections on uh, dependency approach through his works on capitalism and underdevelopment in Latin America and the sociology of development and underdevelopment of sociology and how he, uh, how Frank tried to look at underdevelopment not as, as an original position, original situation but a created condition, okay. And in the, in, in the Next week, we have come to the closure of the eighth week of this massive open online course on sociology of development. From the ninth week, uh, in the ninth week, we are going to, to have discuss the, the Latin American dependency school uh, in a more focused manner. And I mean, we have already discussed the background to the dependency school. And now we'll, we'll discuss, I mean, in, in, the, in the lectures to follow, we will discuss um, and the Latin American in terms of two lectures in the ninth week uh, will um, uh, try to cover uh, the entire dependency theory before you know, moving on to the critics of dependency theory uh, and in terms of two lectures we are going to cover the how uh, the how the dependency perspective is taking shape and how the ECLA analysis was uh, radicalized through the works of Furtado and Sankel, Sankel's model of global dualism, uh, Marxist influences through the works of Cardoso and Faleto, uh, new Marxist influences through the works of Dos Santos and Marini and the crystallized theory of dependence through the works of Andergunder Frank. Before moving on to critics of uh, dependency theory, in the critic of the dependency theory, we, uh, I mean we will discuss the neoclassical reaction, we will also discuss the Marxist critique of the dependency theory, I mean development versus underdevelopment and then we will discuss um, how dependency theory is at the crossroads, the debate among the dependence tests uh, and so on. Okay? Now we are going to move to the ninth week uh, and we completed the 8th week of this course today. Thank you.